Season 2, Episode 1. Hello, I'm James Roy Lawson. And I'm Pat Axbom. And this is UX Podcast. Welcome to Season 2. We're still based in Stockholm, Sweden, and if our first season is anything to go by, you're still listening to us in over 200 countries and territories all over the world. And I have to be honest with you, James, it's going to take some time for me to wrap my head around the fact that after 310 episodes in Season 1, we are now in a Season 2. We are, but I'm going to reassure myself by calling this one episode 311. Excellent. (laughs) Donna Litshaw is an executive coach, keynote speaker, and with us today to talk about her new great book, The Leader's Journey, Transforming Your Leadership to Achieve the Extraordinary. Her mission is to help unconventional leaders transform their impact so that they can make a positive change in the world. Donna works with superheroes and teams of superheroes at companies like Google, Disney, Twitter, Microsoft, MailChimp and Adobe, as well as a plethora of startups and non-profits. I want to work with superheroes. (laughs) You can learn more. You are a superhero pair. (laughs) Of course, (laughs) we all are. You can learn more about Donna, her work at uh, DonnaLitshaw.com, where you can also get her free newsletter, toolkit, exercises, workshops, courses, and of course, info on how to order her books. So the regular listeners to the podcast will know over the years, um, I anyway joke about the fact that um, if you've you've got something really important to say in your book, you've got to say it in the first three chapters because I'm terrible at reading full books. It's it's a it's a thing I work on constantly to try and overcome. Um, and today, ahead of this interview with Donna, we were supposed to skim the book. Um, yeah, you know, prepare ourselves for the interview. I actually wrote this morning. I don't know how I'm going to have time to read the book beforehand. No time because we have a holiday today in Sweden. <laughs> and and I'd already said that. Oh my word! I'm trying to skim it, but I can't. I, I kept I kept getting drawn in, and I found myself reading the book rather than every time I tried to skim it, I ended up reading it. And it's kind of testament actually to the book that um, it kind of it's kind of unskimmable. Yeah, because then I started reading it, and it was like, oh, and I, this is literally a quote from our chat this morning. Wow, this is a good book. It's speaking right to me. <laughs> and that, honestly, I mean fantastic work Donna in engaging us in that way that it felt also maybe perhaps because we are the perfect target group for you I don't know but how does that make you feel (laughs) (laughs) the honest answer (laughs) if you want it is um you know I, I wrote the book for busy leaders busy CEOs busy executives and I always try to make my my work very, very skimmable and scannable so you can just zip through it. And so on the the one hand, I'm so glad I I, uh, suck you in in that way because it's all so important. On the other hand, I'm also thinking, oh my God, but (laughs) just (laughs) I like... Crap! What did I do? But um, no, I think uh, if if your experience is like all of my other readers, it's um, you're going to read it all, but you will zip through it because you can't stop reading. So, um. (laughs) so one one thing I think because like me and Pat, we're 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 actually not leaders in the in the conventional sense sense, because we're both you know have our own companies and self employed. So if anything, we lead ourselves. But the context that we work in often have elements of leadership in what we do and what we achieve. Um, but I, I actually personally think one particular aspect of the book that um, makes it approachable is the, the, the superhero theme to it or structure to it. Actually, in my, in my notes, I wrote down the, the, the superhero story arc mm. um, is what I noted down. Yeah, I think um, it, you know, it's another one of those funny paradoxes of 
how I live my life, which is I think superhero analogies are extremely accessible. And half the time I wonder, man, am I being juvenile with my, <laughs> with my references? And <laughs> like I'm talking about capes and superheroes, but I'll, um, I'll, I'll backtrack uh, a minute if uh, it would help for our listeners Go to talk it. about what, um, what, all right. So the, the context of the book is I have a, very uh, long tenure in the tech world on the product consulting side of things, the um, de- product development side of things, and now on the leadership development side of things. And where this book comes from, and my entire business right now, is that as a product consultants. For years, I was working with senior leaders at at established tech companies, successful teams, successful startups that were scaling. And what I was finding is that they would bring me in to help with product issues, like why are we not moving as fast? Or, you know, we want to increase our influence um, with other teams across our company. And I would come in and realize that what was really going on were people problems, not not product problems. And it was um, specifically an executive team at one uh, big, big company that pulled me aside one time. We were at a, a, a leadership retreat and um, people at this company are very blunt and they just straight up said to me, you know, we keep talking about our customers and building things for our customers. And, and my whole thing at the time was helping companies see how their customers could be heroes and building uh, their entire product ecosystem around that. And um, the, these executives just straight up said to me, you know, I don't feel like a hero. And can I be the hero, please? Because <laughs> like I can't do my job if I don't feel like a hero right now. And um, it, ever since I just... I. I I couldn't stop thinking about that question. Of course, my knee-jerk reaction to them was, no, stop it. You have to turn everyone else into heroes. You're, you're not mm-hmm. the center of the universe. And, um, but I've since, over the last seven years, devoted my entire career, my, uh, my entire business. I ended up pivoting completely into leadership development. And my big question that has driven me is, how can leaders be heroes? Um, well, first, it, 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 does it matter that le- leaders do or don't feel like heroes. Um, second, if so, how, how can they become heroes? And the answer is everything that's in the book and everything that I do now as an executive coach, the answer is yes, you not only can be a hero, but you do have to feel like a hero if you're going to be successful at your job and successful at, especially I still work in tech, all of my clients work in tech, successful at bringing your business to the future and scaling and, you know, launching successful products, but you not only have to feel like a hero of your own story, you feel like a, you have to feel like a superhero. And, um, I love superhero stories and, and comics and, and movies. So a lot of the book takes you through what makes a superhero and how can you apply this to your own leadership? So that's, uh, for listeners, that's the, the superhero background mm. that we're, we're talking about here. Yeah. And um, the, the um, when you said there as well about the, uh, the the universe doesn't revolve around you, you know, everyone else has to be a hero instead. But you in the in the book you you say that um, you know, the story does start with you, uh, your identity. Just as we've we've seen with many superheroes, they they don't necessarily realise that they are the centre of the story and the superhero in the beginning. And I think oh that that to me that story starts with you was was. Um, I, I, that touched me at that point when you think, oh yeah, it, it kind of does. If you... Yeah, it, it, it touched me too because, so, the world that I come from is the tech world. I've been working in tech for 25 years now. I've had so many terrible bosses over the years and I have often thought we we have this there's this term servant leadership i've often thought man you know the best bosses like i've had great bosses too the best bosses on the surface felt selfless they empowered everyone they worked with to do amazing things they always made me feel as someone who reported to them like i was the center of their universe or they were someone who if they worked for me they still made me feel like i was the center of the universe and mm. i always 
had this idea of like, you know, you as a leader, you're supposed to let go of your ego, let go of yourself and really just be thinking about the impact that you want to have in the world. But what I've found over the years is that a lot of us, when we're in leadership positions, we're so concerned with the impact that we forget about what it takes to make an impact, which is you have to have strength and we're so concerned with power yet we look outside for power and people to give us power but power i can't believe i'm saying this out loud but seriously power comes from within <laughs> i'm not a very woo woo person but now apparently that's the industry i'm in which is helping you find your inner power so that you can bring everyone else along help them find theirs and that's how you build successful businesses so yeah it's totally like the movies when you know an un uh, unlikely superhero suddenly shows up and they keep bumbling around and making a mess out of everything. And then they learn, Oh, hang on. It's me all along. <laughs> I have to grow up. And so it's all the same thing. And I think this is what you're doing in your book as well. You're telling these engaging stories, just like you're doing right now. And you're bringing us on your journey with that first story about that event where you realize, well, Maybe I'm not focusing on the right thing, and you're, you're changing the whole focus of your business. You're changing your outlook on how things work, and you're bringing us on off, all, all of that journey, which is fantastic uh, to me. I, I appreciate that. That was It was really hard for me to do. It's almost like I'm my own worst... Um, my own worst subject or my own worst client. I hate talking about myself. Um, I'd rather remove myself completely from the picture and just help other people mm. be amazing. And it, um, this was the hardest thing I've ever written, which is, it just, there was no way to remove myself from the impact I wanted the book to have, which ironically is part of the point of the book. And it's what I help founders and CEOs and executives and, uh, or, you know, managers at giant tech companies. Like it's what I help other people mm. understand as well. And I had to go through it myself. And that's um, why it's so powerful. I yeah. think, Cause that's, I mean, that's, that's vulnerability. I mean, and it's coming across in how you're writing it because mostly, I mean, if you write a, leadership book usually you want people to think that you are great and you come with all the answers and that's not the way you're coming across at all it's like we're exploring this together these are some different paths we should be exploring these are things that i've witnessed happening and this is what i learned from them i and again i I appreciate that you should have seen an early early version of this book when i initially sent an early draft to pre-readers um you know use a tech analogy and when writing a book you you uh you prototype your, your babies and you put them out there as soon as you can in front of people who are actually your target audience and you figure out how they experience it. And yeah, the, the early draft of the book, the feedback <laughs> was universally <laughs> something like, who are you? <laughs> and why should I care about what you have to say? Oh, wow. And so, my God, is it hard. I definitely got a good, glorious kick in the butt from early pre-readers who um, reminded me, oh, right, <laughs> this is my whole thesis. <laughs> like, yeah, I do, have to, I do have to bring myself into this. There's no way not to. Yeah. But, I mean, exactly. whether you you're a manager... Exactly, you end up being a catch-22. Or, yeah. It's a, yeah, and we all do. It's so hard. Mm. It is vulnerable. Being in a position where you want to move people forward and, and to accomplish whatever it is you want to accomplish, it is really scary and vulnerable. Mm. And, um, yeah, we all do it. So, yeah, I'm glad you get that out of the book because I do... Uh, now, in, in the version that's out in the world, that is the part that people really seem to appreciate that really seems to to hook them is mm. the uh intertwinedness of my story and their stories as readers and the stories in the book of all the amazing people i've worked with over the years yeah yeah there's a quote in the book um trying to be someone you are not is a waste of time and i think that is very apt because it feels to me like we tend to think about what a leader should be. And that's sort of what you were saying before. This is, this is how I, leaders, I thought leaders were. And everyone also has to hear that all constantly from others. This is how leaders should be. 
And then, then you try to be that instead of reaching out and being who you actually are, which is what you are helping people realize. Yeah. I mean, I come to, to people, people come to me all the time and unlikely people who you, you wouldn't expect to have this challenge come to me. So it might be underrepresented leaders in tech who, you know, this you would expect, which is I'll have women or underrepresented folks come to me and say, oh my God, everyone keeps telling me to speak up, be louder. I have some come to me who say, hey, my performance evaluations, I keep, <laughs> I keep being told um, to like, be less abrupt. But uh, you know, I'm, the, I'm the VP. Like, what am I supposed to do? No one listens to me. So they're constantly being told what to do, but you also hear it from, I work with a lot of founder CEOs and, and uh, executive teams where even they come it could be someone who you would never expect deals with something like imposter syndrome or people telling them what to do but they come to me saying oh my god everyone keeps like my investors my board they keep telling me i need to show up in this way i need to be more loud i need to be quieter i need to be more confident and um it's hard. It takes a lot of energy to, you know, that saying fake it till you make it. it mm. It's true to you know, a certain extent. But if you're going against who you are at your core, you're going to waste a lot of energy trying to show up as this leader who you think you're supposed to be. And when, you know, just like the superheroes in the comic, when you can find your own inner strength and see them as superpowers, I don't care how quiet you are. Being quiet, if you're at the point where you either started a company or you've ever been promoted into any position where you're responsible for other people if you're quiet then there's strength in being quiet if we figure out how to embrace that great you'll Hmm. make an impact so yeah i i don't like the leadership literature out there that tells people how to be and what to do and it's um i find it a waste of time how do you make people believe you when you say that (laughs) Because, I mean, just just the part about being quiet, I think, is one of those, I mean, being shy as a leader. How is that even possible? (laughs) So, I know you would never think that it's something Mm. that that exists. The, um, you know, the answer, okay, so this is another reason why I wrote the book, which is, how do I convince People, well, I don't tell them. I don't talk at them. Because, you know, in the business world, another thing that's very in vogue is like storytelling, storytelling. It's it's Mm. something that all leaders need to have. You all need to be great storytellers. Mm. And the thing is, even though here we were just saying a few minutes ago, you matter, your story matters, like no one actually really cares about your story. (laughs) And you don't Mm. need to run around telling people Mm stories are telling people what to do. So when I work with folks, I mean, yeah, I could sit around telling people, you know, what are your superpowers? Write them down and great. Now go own them. Okay. You're quiet. Good. Excellent. Good job. Now go be a (laughs) superhero. It just just wouldn't work. And so it's a a lot like, um, you know, I'll say, I guess, because I have this tech background, which I know a lot of us do, it's it's a lot like you can't tell your customers, hey, this thing is amazing, go use it. People have to experience it. And so when I work with executives, what we do is we treat their leadership and the impact that they want to have almost like a research project where we go and we mine their their past experiences. So how have you showed up in the past? How have you made an impact in the past? When you do that, that's one facet of being able to see, ah, actually, um, I use quiet leadership as an example. Oh, man, you know, whenever I'm really quiet, I have amazing ideas. And then when I do speak, people listen, especially because I don't talk that much. So mm-hmm. when when I do say something, they're like, 
oh, wow, the CEO is talking. <laughs> we have to listen. Right. And so it's, um, you know, one, mining your past helps you see how your strengths have played out before and have moved you and others forward. But it's still, it's not enough. And so another thing we do is we go out and we mine your people, your system. And I'll go out and talk to people. So it's, it's really like a, a, a user research project yeah. in this sense. I talk to people who work with you, who rely on you, who you want to move your business forward and who are essential to your success. And I find out how they experience you. So just like you would go out and talk to customers, find out how they experience using your products, or you go out and talk to customers and find out how they get things done or what's important to them or what their goals are, what their dreams are, what magic would look like if everything, if they could wave a magic wand over the problems they have and your product could save the day. It's, um, it's the same exact thing. And so when I go out and... I kickstart conversations between a leader or a team because this is the same with with teams although that will be probably my next book whenever I'm <laughs> recovered oh, and ready, no, no. ready the for the third that. one in the trilogy but exactly yeah you you go <laughs> out and um and you find out what the real story is you end up finding things like I'll use quiet leadership as an example again. Wow, yeah, when they do speak up in a meeting, we listen because otherwise they're so quiet. Or if they don't say anything in a meeting, we look over to them and find out what's going on because we want to know what they're saying. Um, and you find out what kind of impact you've had on people and you, and you can have so that you keep meeting your shared business goals because ultimately I think this is another misconception we have. Leadership, it's not all about just external influence but it's also not just all about feeling better inside and getting rid of burnout and all of the inner mental health stuff it's about finding that perfect mix of being the best version of you and making an impact and you don't work in a, in a vacuum so you got to know how you're doing and how your superpowers are being experienced by your broader universe in order to really use them mm. I think the, yeah, you, you, you don't work, you don't exist in a vacuum. And I think what's, what was um, what I liked about the, the, the retrospective approach or looking back approach that you um, talk about now and go through in the book, that um, it, you can use childhood as part of that process too. So you, could be, you don't have to be an established leader with lots of leadership to look back on. You can, you can be very new in a leadership role and still look back on earlier bits of your life and, and pull out these 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 um, core aspects of of what lies you know lies there underneath as as your qualities as a well, coming up upcoming leader yeah when i when i talk about people's backgrounds i get the best stories and actually maybe that's another answer to your question how do i convince people i let them tell me yeah. their <laughs> their stories and then i let everyone they work with tell mm. me their stories and i don't actually have to convince anyone of anything but I've heard the most amazing stories from people mm. like, you know, when I was six years old on the playground, I did, you know, I was always inventing games and then getting everyone to play these new games or, you know, just, I think that was actually an example that I've heard. But um, yeah, our inner strengths and the things that make us most excited and that really light us up, they've always been there since we were since we were little, we just can't always see them because we're not always looking for them. Mm. But they're always there. It doesn't have to be in a work context. It's just there in life all the time. So we've, we've sort of passed through identity and, and superpower as, as part of your, your four larger themes throughout the book. And when it comes to mission, uh, it starts off telling us, that we probably talk about a lot of time. If you're not clear on where you're, uh, where you're going, uh, you can't get to where you want to go. Uh, and for me, that's interesting. I recently read a blog post that sort of upended my thinking, which talked about maybe you should give up on your dreams. And sometimes it's, and that's what I was thinking about as I was reading this chapter is like, so maybe just, I just have the wrong idea of what my mission or goal or vision is. 
Uh, and that's I've been going through that for the past no, two weeks since I read that post. Uh, how do I find out what my mission is? <laughs> yeah, that's and that's a t- it's mm. fascinating. It's it's a tough one because even it's it's hard to see when it's ourselves and and our lives. I've worked with. Um, Oh man! I mean, I, I worked once with a, a CEO of a billion-dollar company who was not even sure of what <laughs> what that was, and you would think that it would be clear. And um, and at some point, also, you know, we are intertwined with our, our businesses as well. So that was presenting itself as a business issue, where people around the company were like, "What are we doing? <laughs> what is our what is our purpose? What is our our focus?" and um, it's so it's it's very 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 common and it's it, you know it's easy to just float through life without being clear on it but the wait, so one i will say um you are not alone and that's okay <laughs> <laughs> so um it's it's hard to do second i mean it's the same thing as finding your superpowers which is when you can go through your past and really look at, all right, when was I at my absolute best in general, or when was I my absolute best as a leader more specifically? And you look at the outcomes you've had. So for example, uh, you know, use this uh, inventing new games on the playground example, which is, yeah, I was always inventing new games on the playground. And what was the outcome? Ah, well, um, I got kids and all my friends to be really active and engaged and, um, and have fun. Hmm. Right. So let's say that's it. And, and, um, you know, I'm just, just making this up on the fly, but let's say we look at some other stories of, um, projects that you've loved working on at work. Oh yeah. Well, um, you know, my last company, I created this or new organization from scratch and we had a team of five and then, you know, we had a team of a uh, hundred and, and it was incredible. When you look at the impact you've had there, what was it? Oh, well, um, you know, it was incredible to get people engaged and involved in the work we were doing and they um, had fun while doing it. And yeah, the fact that we were successful was great, but the fact that we had so much fun doing it was what really makes me happy. So let's say you hear enough stories like this. It could be that your mission is to engage your world and, and create more fun Mm. at work. You know, it's a simple example, but um, if that's what it is, then let that become your hypothesis that you can now go test and apply to everything you do in the future when you can Uh, evolve those. And yeah. It, it Sorry, I, I, was saying, I guess going, that yeah. doesn't stop. I guess that doesn't stop you from achieving business goals. I mean, you know, if, if you think, if, if you come to that conclusion that you and what drives you and what makes you end up in successful places is happiness at work, for example, then then I guess you use that to drive your you and your group towards that you know more more business related objective. You do. And that, I think that's the key with all of this is that you think of the inner mission as something that's going to then, it has to actually resonate with the outer mission. So your your team, your organization, and your business, whether you own the business or not, if you don't own your business and you work for someone else, it has to at least resonate because if what you care about as a human is not what your company cares about. You're going to not just be unhappy, but you're not going to do a great job and be as effective as you could be. So it, it not only has to resonate, but it's something that you can then align deliberately. So I'll use the happiness example. Um, I, you know, I once worked for a company where their, um, their mission was to deliver food happiness and it was a delivery 
ser- service kind of thing. Well, now it's super. The, the, I guess everyone has uh, internet enabled delivery, but um, at the time it was kind of a new thing, and the, the idea was food happiness. So let's say you're that person who has spent their life making people happy. If you work at that company or you, you founded that company or you, you move into executive leadership in that company, it's going to perfectly resonate. And not only will it resonate, but then you can start quantifying and thinking about real measurable business outcomes. Because if food happiness, uh, using this company as an example, food happiness was their thing. And it was nice for like branding materials and, and their, um, you know, style guides and, and all of that and their company values. But when the service would break down and half of New York City wouldn't get their restaurant delivery for dinner, there was no food happiness happening. And so (laughs) they were actually able to, you know, start quantifying and aligning their business goals towards that and making sure that everything they built um, was not just on brand, but that that metrics aligned. So it helped uh, them come up with new features and testing things and um, prioritizing roadmaps. It's, it becomes everything. Mm. And I love that it's simple. I mean, that's the thing, isn't it? And for me, this aligns with you were saying, oh, <laughs> almost felt, felt embarrassing to say power comes from within. But I mean, it's <laughs> even the mission comes from within. And I don't think we think about that enough, that there are so many things that we can find within ourselves. Because we talk, talk so much about you can be whatever you want to be. You can make any goal you want. But I'm realizing more and more that doesn't necessarily mean that I will enjoy that goal. I may be able to accomplish it, but... It's more fun if I find within myself, what do I really want to do and try to uh, express that as a goal? It, you know, there's another piece also, which is it, it, it not only, it comes from within and it's so important to see because a lot of us in the tech world, again, whether we work for companies or we, we found companies or both, a lot of us are problem solvers. So we often mistakenly see our mission as fixing things that are broken, which is great. But when we do that, we lose sight of why it matters that we're fixing all the broken things. And when you're not clear on the big picture impact that you can have, life and business is just a game of whack-a-mole where you're just fixing problems all the time. And you're never going to be happy. Your team's always going to be frustrated and your business doesn't thrive that way. So being clear on big picture mission, like the why of what we do is so, so, so important. What a beautiful articulation of why fixing problems can be a problem. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I have learned that the hard way yeah. many times over. Yes. Huh. One thing I've been wondering about, though, is, I mean, you've, you've uh, you very good job of, of pointing out, you know, finding this, your superpower, and and you even say use it for good, and that comes up in numerous times in the book that you point out that using your superpower for good, which which raises, of course, the the, the question of the flip side, the antihero, the 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 evil genius, or the kind of you know the the superhero that isn't you know isn't doing for good. What I think my question here is: um, Do we need to watch out for any flags to make sure that we aren't blindly using our superpowers for evil? Yeah, we do. We constantly need to be aware of that, especially the the more senior we get and the more um, high impact we get in in leadership the impact you have can be so much greater on the positive side and then also on the negative side. And especially in the tech world, this is such an important and timely issue that I see. I, okay, how to put this? There there was a time I work, I would say the, um, big chunk of my practice is founders and startup and scale up executive teams. And I love that world. Even if I'm working with giant tech companies, it's still probably a a startup or scale up division at the tech company that I'm working with. 
and there's so much potential to do really cool things with technology and in building new companies and organizations. And there's so much potential to do damage on a human level to the people we work with and then to the world at large. And so I, um, you know, partly wrote this book because I want more people to think about the impact that they're having in the world. It's, it's a bit of a cliche in the tech world, you know, what's, what's your purpose? Oh, to make the world a, a better place. But it's, it's essential because if you're not doing that, what's, what's the point? I mean, even, you know, to use comic book metaphor, even supervillains think they're, work, they're making the world a better place. Mm. So um, it's, you know, and the, the best ones eventually learn how to do it properly, <laughs> and then they convert <laughs> over to the good side. But um, it's important to not just want to make the world a better place, but then to actually be able to measure the impact you're having and then see the impact and experience the impact you're having. And so when I work with people, it's, I won't work with you if I don't think that you're adding value to our industry or to the world. And if you're unsure, I'll push you on it. Because Hmm. for me, the last thing I want to do is help more founders, for example, succeed if they're going to be doing damage in the world or giant tech companies. And so um, it's, although at the point that you're getting to the level of a giant tech company, it's, it, it is a lot harder to measure impact in a way because there's what your entire company is doing as a company and then there's what your organization is doing as an organization within that company. Um, so it's not easy, mm-hmm. you know, and I'll, I'll admit that. And I think we all working in this industry admit that, but it's, everyone can have an impact. I mean, you even see this at big tech companies right now with people quitting over certain ethical issues with AI and then, you know, people up in leadership realizing important people are quitting and um, trying to make an impact. So like everyone can, can make an impact. And it's so important that we're thinking about it at all times. I think that's a beautiful note to end on. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you so much, Donna. This was fantastic. Thank you, Donna. Of course. Of course, it was a pleasure chatting with you both, as always. I'm going to come straight out of it, Per. I am a Donna fan. This is the the third time we've we've chatted to Donna on the podcast. Um, The previous time has been quite a while ago now, 2016 and 2017. Um, But not only reading her stuff's great, talking to her is wonderful. Yeah, she's very insightful. I'm a Donna fan too. And I'm so pleased by how how open she is even about the struggles of writing her book and and how these early drafts that didn't resonate with her her early pre-readers, she's telling us everything about, she's she's so open. And that's what I loved about the book itself as well, that she's so open and that's what makes it so good because you can sense that it's believable and it's about her and she's... She's putting herself inside the At the same time, the it's book. a story we all recognize. I mean, mm. the, she says herself there about, um, you know, constantly being told to be something. And, you know, the, the imposter syndrome, yeah. fake it till you make it, um, you know, leveraging your strengths. It, it, I mean, so much of this is, is things we recognize. It's relatable. Definitely. Yeah. And she makes it relatable. <laughs> Yeah, it's very impressive. I mean, I mean, and I'm a huge superhero fan. You probably you not beat as me much on that as scale. I, am. I mean, I'm, I'm slightly more sci-fi, I reckon, and you're slightly more superhero. But yeah, um, you know, we're, we're 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 fans of of um, things with powers, I guess. <laughs> mm. Which which does lead me to the question, though, Pat. I mean, what are your superpowers? I mean, that's so hard. You, you kind of think that you know what your superpowers are and then, and you try to think about, about what context uh, you, you try to find that in. Is it in the workplace, at home? Uh, what, what she suggests in the book is, is starting by identifying three of your own heroes and then start thinking about why are they your heroes? What, what characteristics do you admire most about, about them? And I've always had one of my heroes is uh, Astrid Lindgren the author of Pippa Longstocking and, and so many other children's books. And I've tried to figure out, well, what is it about her? Is it her writing? Is it her style? Is it? And actually, it's, it's about her caring. 
So she cares so much about children, and that's yeah. that's her driving force. And I think that is what resonates with me. So I'm I'm recognizing by pulling from that, I recognize well that is what I want to uh, contribute the, the, the with. The things well. that I've, I've actually all um, throughout my life, I always have a bit of a problem with with hero worshiping. Um, I've always been a reluctant hero worshiper, um, and it's partly because of the whole thing that heroes it's it's your perceived perception of who they are rather than who they genuinely are so i i really like the example donna gave about thinking back to your childhood or rather thinking back in life um because because that oh, right. that yeah. is undeniably about you it's it's not about hero projection it's a, it's not about kind of perceived qualities in people who are you know they're, they're marketed towards you, so you're going to have a skewed perception of some of these things. And and you know, thinking back about your life, that's why I ask you, what is your superpower? Because you know, looking back, you've got you've got you know a lot of decades of experience now to look back and and think about that. And yeah, Donna herself, she, I mean, she she got she called both me and you out without realizing it um, when she's talking about the um, you know trying to fix things and playing whack a mole. Fixing problems itself can be a problem. Um, you know, we, we're both <laughs> yeah. we're both you know, guilty of that. So, what's the big mission? Mm. What are our superpowers? Right. So, I mean, that's the thing, isn't it? You can get stuck in thinking that your superpower is something that you happen mm. to be very good at, because but it's not about the task. It's exactly what you're saying. What's the what's the mission? Why are you doing these things? What are you trying to achieve? Yeah. So end? you've got your qualities. I mean, what are these superpower qualities? But where are they taking you? And, you know, I, I, again, wonderful talking to Donna, wonderful reading a book, but this, this is quite a hard, it's, a, it's an awkward interview in the sense that it, it kicks off a bit of an existential, you know, crisis effectively or potentially. Um, she's going to, she's going to email now and tell us that, oh my God, that wasn't what I was supposed to do to you. But, but, but at the same time, it's a journey <laughs> and this is all part of looking back on your journey so far, isn't it? Yeah, and it can feel frustrating, and it can feel like a lot of things to think about. And you read read the book, and it maybe we um, it sounded simple when we were talking about it in, in the interview, but she does bring it up how how conflicting it can feel, and you think you're supposed to be going faster, but you're really not. But what she also says is that without without gravity because she's alluding again to the superpowers, you would drift aimlessly or simply float away. And and the thing is, for me, that's just a way of saying also, no pain, no gain. You have to go through all this. So the existential mm-hmm. crisis is good, because that means yeah. the beginning of something. Exactly. Beginning of another part of the story. Recommended listening for this show, obviously, would be our previous interviews with Donna. Yeah, that is exactly right, Pat. Which are episodes 165 and 140 of season one. In season one. one. <laughs> <laughs> um, 140 is um, story mapping um, back in September 2016, um, based around her, her first book um, through Rosenfeld Media. Um, and then just over a year later, or about a year later, episode 165, Enterprise Stories, um, where we talk, where we take some of our ideas and we apply them to Enterprise um, UX and Enterprise situations. Nice. Also, excellent interviews. Absolutely. Donna fans. <laughs> and here's something for you to think about. If you want James and Pat, i.e. us, i.e. Yep. UX podcast, <laughs> as, as part of your next conference, event, or in-house training, we are offering workshops, talks, and courses to inspire and help you grow as individuals, as teams, and organizations. And you get in touch by emailing hey at uxpodcast.com. Remember to keep moving. See you on the other side. James, did you hear that Batman invited all the superheroes to an evening discussing Bitcoin investments? No, I, I didn't, Per. 
Yes, Superman didn't go because it was a crypto night. Oh, 